Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, last class in our three-class Marine Mammal Identification Master class series. Um, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is really the first time we've tried to do a more in-depth master class on a particular topic, so we really appreciate the folks that have um, shown up and enjoyed that. Um, I am going to get us started by welcoming um, today's guest lecturer to the screen. This is Sue Pemberton, our curatorial assistant in the Department of Ornithology and Mammalogy. And you are also the Academy's Marine Mammal Stranding Coordinator, is that right? Correct. Excellent. Um, and I think just before we get started, uh, I'd love for you to just tell us how you got interested in marine mammals in the first place and kind of built all this expertise. Well, I started out in 1993 as a live marine mammal rescuer and rehabilitator and did that for about 18 years. And that crossed over with my interest in knowing what Ray Bandar does, mm. the legendary Ray Bandar. And I would see him sometimes on the beach crossing. I'm working live. He's working dead. And, and I knew that the Academy was going to be opening up again. And so I reached out to Mo in, I think it was maybe September of 2008 and started as a volunteer and then slowly made my way in as a paid employee over the course of a couple of years. And here I am. Excellent. Well, we're so, so glad to have you and really looking forward to today's class. I will make a quick note if anyone's watching with young kids, there's probably going to be some imagery in this that is not wildly appropriate for them. So, so maybe keep that in mind. Um, and I also want to remind those watching that you can ask Sue questions at any time, just by leaving them in the YouTube chat box. And if you have not used YouTube before, um, as a registered user, super easy, they'll just prompt you to do a very quick registration process, and then you'll be able to type away. Um, we will also be using that chat box to drop in various resources as um, Sue moves through the material. So keep an eye there, whether you intend to chat back to us or not. Um, let me add your slides to the screen and I'm going to go ahead and get out of here again, Sue, thank you so much. And we will see you at the end to ask our, um, questions from our audience. Thank you, Laurel. Um, hopefully you were able to catch Mo Flannery's, uh, first, first presentation. Uh, if you didn't, I'll, I'll tell you that the, the Academy is part of the West Coast Marine Mammal Stranding Network. We are permitted by NOAA uh, to do these responses. And our primary task is to collect data and do species identification and uh, look for signs of human interaction, uh, rule in or rule out human interaction. So that's our primary goal when we're going out. In learning all of this stuff, uh, I've learned a lot of really uh, fun tricks for identifying and, and kind of keeping the information streamlined in my head. And I'm here to share those with you today. Next slide. Mo, next slide. Thank you. Um, if you haven't already uh, got these, these resources in your hands, um, we made these great, uh, kind of snapshots of each species, uh, the pinniped cheat sheet, the cetacean cheat sheet. Uh, you can always use iNaturalist to help you identify, and we'll talk a little bit um, about how to do that further down in the, in the presentation. And you've also been, a, a beautiful um, Google form has been created for you to kind of play along uh, with this, because we're going to be challenging you. We're going to talk about the different features of the six species of pinniped that occur here. And we're gonna challenge you to identify them. So be ready, get your thinking caps on. Um, there's also some tips here, photos uh, to take to help with identification. That helps us a lot when you're sending us photos to the Academy and we'll give you that contact information um, towards the end of the presentation and it's very helpful on iNaturalist. I go on iNaturalist every day to clean up identifications and ID uh, marine mammals for folks. Uh, so if you're ever on there and would like some help with your ID, you can find me or tag me. It's just Sue Pemberton, one word, um, on iNat. Next slide. So here's a, a, a little more of an explanation for photos to take. Um, we like to see photos of the head, uh, the front flippers, the rear flippers, and um, 
pretty much anything that you could take photos of. If the teeth are available, we're not encouraging people to poke around on dead animals. Uh, but if it's laying on its side, you can take photos of the abdomen because that will help us determine the, the sex. Um, the teeth, if they're available to be uh, photographed. On cetaceans, large and small, we'd love to see a photo of the head. Again, the teeth, the front flippers, dorsal fins, which are really helpful. The shape can be very distinctive. Uh, and the tail flukes, um, that helps us a lot in determining species and if it's a known individual to researchers. Next slide. So I don't know if everybody knows, but um, this the San Francisco Bay Area has probably one of the most diverse um, collection of, of pinniped species. So pinnipeds are seals and sea lions. We have one of the most diverse probably in the world. There are areas up in the Arctic that have 10 or 12 species, but it's all spread out. They're not overlapping like they are here. There are some three or four or five species overlaps, but we're very lucky to call six species uh, our ocean neighbors. Um, and the way that I find it easy to remember them is to group them um, in three separate groups. There are, this is a good one to make note of. There are two seals, there are two sea lions, and there are, are two fur seals. So if you just remember it like that, that's going to come in handy because as we go through this sleuthing process, we eliminate things by group. So uh, we will, we will employ that process a little bit later. But um, we have very quickly, the two seals are the Northern Elephant Seal, the Pacific Harbor Seal. The two sea lions are the California Sea Lion, which are the ones you see out at Pier 39. Um, the Stellar Sea Lion, which are out on Año Nuevo. If you live up in the Mendocino, um, Northern Sonoma Coast, you can see them pretty readily on the offshore rocks there. And then we have two fur seals, uh, the northern fur seal, which um, are, are enjoying very um, high numbers out on the Farallon Islands. And then a Guadalupe fur seal, which doesn't um, breed here in the United States. They breed in Mexico. Um, and they, they come up, we start seeing them in around February and March, and they're here for most of the year after that. Uh, so just keep in mind, there's three groups, three seals, three se uh, two seals, two sea lions, and two fur seals. Next. We do have probably a couple dozen species of cetacean that live off of our coast. We've seen a little bit of everything that's on the screen there. Um, but there are really some that are much more common than others, like the humpback and the gray whale for large whales. Uh, for dolphins, we see bottlenose dolphins and um, the occasional common dolphin, striped dolphin, Rizzo's dolphin, things like that. But really, it's mostly the bottlenose dolphin. And for the smaller cetacean, the smallest of the ones in our area, um, the harbor porpoise, which I don't see on this, but the harbor porpoise is probably the most common one that we have here. And they, they are um, enjoying a pretty successful comeback into the San Francisco Bay, um, which is really great to see. Once we remove the human built obstacles for them to return, they have returned. Uh, and it's really, really um, an exciting scientific and, and conservation story. Next. So here we go. So when you're standing over a carcass, um, this is a deductive process. It, this is less about um, teaching you to memorize everything about all six of these species of pinniped or cetacean. And it's more about using the resources that we've given you, the cheat sheets, to kind of rule in and rule out. There are things you can rule out just based straight on size. So you're ruling in and ruling out. You're looking at the overall size initially. There are some of these species that come in all sizes from birth to full grown adult and some that are just yearlings on up. 
Um, the flipper size and shape, which is very helpful. The features of the fur. If you remember in, in the first presentation, uh, we talked about the features of the fur in a nor or in fur seals in general. You can move their fur in many directions, where most of the other ones, um, the other species, the fur lays pretty flat in one direction on their body. So those are things to note. The teeth. There are a couple of species that have very distinctive teeth. Uh, the vibrissa, which are whiskers. Again, the seals have different textures and colors to their, to their whiskers. And those are things to um, pay attention to. Time of year, there are parts of the year where strandings are, are more intense. Um, usually after like elephant seals when they have babies you know these those guys don't get a lot of maternal attendance so when they set off into the world they're not very good at it uh harbor seal pupping season certainly guadalupe's that are just leaving their moms show up here and same with northern fur seals which are uh, they're weaning right about now uh, so we would see more of those on our local beaches and then there are other bones so if you're ever out on the beach and you see a really uh, decomposed carcass and you're trying to photograph it and make sense of it, take photos of the scapula because those can be very, the, the shoulder blade, if that's sticking out, take photos of the shoulder blade because that's very distinctive as well in, in a couple of these species. Next. So here we go. We're going to jump right into it. And how I'm going to do this is I'm going, we're going to have the sleuthing example. And we're going to give you folks about a minute to look at these photos, look at the features on these, on these carcasses. And then we're going to walk through the ID in the next slide. So uh, this one, we have the luxury of a scale bar. I'm not going to tell you the answer, but I'll describe the features. You have long long nailless front flippers. You have a light brown um, pelage. You have longer rear flippers that the, the toes are all about the same length. You have an external ear flap and a little dog face. You can't see it very well, but it's a little dog face. And it's not very big. That's that that uh, scale bar is 15 centimeters. So I'll give you a couple more seconds and then we'll go on to the answer. If you have any questions about it or comments about it, now would be the time to ask or when we go to the next slide. You can go to the next slide now. So you'll see that we've circled some of the things and I'll mention that these circles serve twofold. One is that we're going to talk about them more intensively because it's, it, it's what's going to help us identify this animal. But these are also things that we want you to take photographs of. So um, it might just look like it's a laid out sea lion. This was probably a beach watch reported animal. You could see the little line in the sand. Um, right by the nose. But some of the features we'd look for on the face, um, let's start there. You'll see that there's a little external ear flap. Can you put a little arrow on that, Mo? There's a little external ear flap. Uh, the face uh, is a little dog-like face. Um, moving down to the flipper, you'll see that there are no nails. It's long and tapered. And the, the top of the flipper, there is a distribution of hair that goes about two thirds of the way down the front flipper. In the rear flippers, um, they're set up perfectly because you can see the underside of one or the ventral side of one and the dorsal side of the other. And you can see that there's a distribution on the left, on the right front flipper, there's hair or fur on the top and on the left rear flipper, sorry, the other one was rear. On the left rear flipper, you can see that it's bare. Um, and that's really important because there are certain um, species that don't have bare 
ventral surfaces of their flippers, and those are the seals. So we can remove seals from this from this um, deductive process. That leaves us four different animals to consider different species, the fur seals and the sea lions. Um, that hair doesn't look um, particularly fluffy like we see in fur seals. The, the um, flippers are a little whiter than we see in fur seals. So I could safely remove the um, fur seals for consideration in this particular um, example. And that would leave us with the two species of sea lion. Now, one of them, the California sea lion, the pelage is very, um, is variable from very light honey colored, like the females, adult females will have a really pretty honey color to light brown. And the males can get um, up to adulthood, like dark, dark chocolate brown. The babies are really um, dark as well, and they could be any shade of brown in between there. But the thing is, is that they're brown. Stellar sea lions outside of their natal coat are a pretty uniformly honey colored uh, on the back. On their bellies, they can be a little rust colored because they're walking around on rocks that have poop and things like that. So it's stained, but they're typically honey colored, very light, even the really big males. So this one is a little darker to me for that, that it's more of a chocolate brown as opposed to a, like a honey color. Um, so we could safely remove stellar sea lion from consideration. And that really only leaves us one other animal. Um, and that would be a California sea lion. And this is, if you had California sea lion on your bingo card, then you've got one checked off. This was a California sea lion, a, a young one. Um, there's a question here that says, is there anything about the specimens vibrissa that would be helpful in this case? For the most part in, in um, otoriads, which are the eared seals, um, their vibrissa gets whiter as they grow older at this age or this size, it would be a mix. So it's not really that helpful um, at this age. Uh, there isn't anything about the physical feature, like the feeling of it, like with the um, seals. Um, I don't, I don't know if Mo, Mo probably went into this where the, the, the seal vibrissa are ribbed. So if you run your finger along it, it, it has a little ridge in it. It looks like a barber pole, but they call it beading. So if you ran your finger down it, you could feel that there is a texture to it. With the odoriads, it's actually smooth. Um, stellar sea lions have really long, when they're bigger, older, uh, they have really obnoxiously long vibrissa. I've had one subadult male whose vibrissa was 22 inches long. So that's a, that's a unique identifier for something uh, for that species. How do you think this young sea lion died? It's always hard to tell. A good day on, out in the ocean is perilous for them. Um, there are a lot of things that sea lions can become afflicted with. And so we don't do full beach necropsies. They're very messy and the people who visit those beaches, um, they don't really appreciate that kind of stuff. We do our best to rule out human interaction and things like that. But um, typically uh, an animal this young, like this year, would there it was a big leptospirosis year, which is something that is naturally occurring, endemic in their population. Um, and it surges every four or five years or so. And this, uh, this was the age class that we saw there there uh, because uh, lepto is so cyclical. It leaves a lot of these youngsters very um, naive as far as their immune systems are. And so we had a lot of young animals um, die this year. And I don't know if this was from this year, but this is what we saw a lot of this year. All right, next. All right, so I'll give you guys a moment to look at this. Uh, there's a scale bar there, so you can get a sense of the size. 
and you already know what we like to look at, the head and the front and the rear flipper. So focus on that. So one of the things that we'd want to note about this animal is not only its size, but if you were standing over it, you would see that there are some different colorations to this fur. Uh, it's got a bit of a buffy, a buffy bib. That's a mouthful. A bit of a bit of a buffy bib, and also a little bit of um, buffy cheek patch. And that could be very helpful for us. Um, it isn't a hard and fast for this species, but it's usually one that that will draw us towards um, an ID. Um, so let's go to the next slide, Mo. All right, so we've circled a couple of things here. Again, in this photo, it, it didn't get circled, but it will be of value because if you look at the rear flippers, the, the top is showing on one side and the bottom is showing on the other. So the dorsal and the ventral sides are, are available to us. And the one on the left side is facing upward and it is bare. It's hard to see the sand is on it, but it take my word, it's bare. And then on the top, there's fur distribution down um, the rear flipper. Uh, the nail placement is, is actually very helpful, surprisingly. They have three nails on the three middle toes of their rear flippers. Um, and they're in this particular species, they're offset pretty far back from the edge of the toe, the end of the toe. Um, so these guys, I, you know, these photos are very small on my computer, so I can't really tell if you can see those. Hopefully you can see those nails on there. Um, but looking at the, um, the head, it's a, it's a very petite kind of mousy head. Uh, and it's football shaped on, on profile. And that's very distinctive because there aren't any other pinnipeds that have this particular feature. It's got this very full downward sloping bridge of the nose that gives the effect of a football silhouette. So I call them little football heads. Um, and you'll see there's a nice buffy bib, a uh, cheek patch, turning our focus to the front flipper, you can see that there's a break in the fur beginning at what we call the wrist of this animal was sitting up um, his, his, his or her front flipper would be bending right there. It might not technically be its wrist, but that's the term we use. And you can see there's a break in the fur and then only skin on the dorsal side. This is diagnostic for this species of the six species of pinniped that occur here, no other one has this. So if you have um, any ideas of what you might be looking at, um, I'd love to hear them. Um, but I can tell you also with the front flippers, you can see that they're long and tapered. You can see that the rear flippers are disproportionately long. They, they are typically very long in this species. Um, so if you were looking at your ID sheet and you guessed uh, Northern fur seal, uh, then you are correct. This size, and you'll see it's very petite with that 15 uh, centimeter scale bar and, you know, dog, dog uh, footprints and things like that in the sand. They're very petite. This is about, oh, yay. You guys are getting it right. Um, this is the age class that we see the absolute most, probably 99.5% of the time are young of the year. This, this species mom, uh, they get four months of maternal attendance and we have a pretty healthy breeding population out on the Farallon Islands. So we get a lot of these in October. They're born, you know, the the Northern Hemisphere Odoriads are born in May, June, July. So um, 
we would start seeing these after four months of maternal attendance or if it's a crazy fall and there's a lot of swell and weather or there's just no food sometimes the moms will abandon them and they'll set out on their own to try and make it and they don't always get someplace like the marine mammal center that can help them so um we find this size a lot dead in um october september october november we have had a um a handful of sub adults uh, sub-adult males and a couple of um, adult females, but I was probably working with marine mammals for 20 years before I saw that age class, the older age class. But um, this is a little northern fur seal with those very typical long tapered flippers of fur seals. That's, that's a fur seal thing. And if you were standing by this animal, you could look at the fur. It's um, it's got two distinctive features. It's got really fluffy under fur. They have to maintain their fur like sea otters do. Uh, so if you see them out in the wild, you can see them grooming, or if you happen to be at the Marine Mammal Center and they have some in care, you'll see them constantly grooming like, like sea otters. Um, and they have the fluffy under fur and they have the long um, guard hairs on top that look a little silvery. If you are permitted to handle them, um, you would be hard pressed to find skin between the hairs. It's very numerous. It's not as numerous as sea otters, but um, it's more numerous than say the, the sea lions and the elephant seal and the harbor seal. But um, this is a Northern fur seal. Next slide. Yay. So this one is just one photo from iNaturalist. Uh, and this is good enough. We're able to identify it to species. Um, but there are also a number of opportunities for getting more information um, on something like uh, a species like this. Um, you can see the mouth is open. So you would have a look inside that mouth, take photos. Um, but you would um, look at the teeth for identifying, you would make note of the fact that um, it doesn't have a really long distinctive rostrum. It's got a pretty solid drop off from the forehead down to the nose. The flippers, the coloration, a triangular dorsal fin. It's not super apparent here, It's but a lot of dolphins have a falcated uh, dorsal fin, which means it kind of has some sort of an arch to it. And this little, little one has a, a, a triangular dorsal fin and the rear flippers are there to photograph as well. So I'll let you guys look at this for a second and then uh, we'll go on to the ID page. Any guesses? Anybody have thought? All right, so we're going to walk through this. Um, again, the, there's, the mouth is open, which is always excellent because you can see the teeth. And there is a way to tell porpoises from dolphin. Um, in the lower left corner, you'll see a close-up photo of porpoise teeth. They are um, tall and uh, spatulate. We call it uh, spatulate or... Um, we have a number of names, but we usually just call it spatula shaped. Um, and it's a fresh dead animal, so it hasn't been picked on too much, but the teeth are erupted. Um, the flippers are non-distinct. Um, again, we talked about the triangular dorsal fin. Those are really distinctive to a couple of different species of porpoise that we have here. Uh, there are two types. There's the most common one and that we see all the time, which are the harbor porpoise. And we occasionally get dolls porpoises, um, but those are black and white, very, very distinctly black and white 
often called in as baby orcas. They look nothing like this other than the fact that they have a triangular dorsal fin. So if you're ever walking out at Ocean Beach or you're uh, seeing an animal where you can catch the profile of the dorsal fin, if it's this squatty little triangular dorsal fin, it's a, a harbor or it's a porpoise of some sort, more than likely a harbor porpoise. Um, and you guys are really impressing me with guessing these because not everybody knows this stuff, but this is um, a very young harbor porpoise. This would normally, if you come across something like this, we would love it if you would call the Marine Mammal Center. Um, we have those numbers later on and they um, want to necropsy animals like this when we have opportunities uh, to look a little more in depth at cause of death in the Marine Mammal Center it's not a really an accessible area, they will have somebody come out uh, or you can call Cal Academy's um, hotline number and send us photos and other lovely things like that so we can get to it and learn a little bit about these because, you know, what they can, animals die. We know this, everything dies at some point, but if we can glean some science from it, if we can do things that will help conserve and protect these animals, then, then we're going to try and do it. And these opportunities to, um, with fresh dead animals are, are exactly that excellent opportunities. Next slide. All right. Sleuthing example four. We again have the benefit of a scale bar. You can see it up just um, towards the tail from the shoulder. It's very small, which means this animal's very big. Uh, I'll give you guys a second to kind of look it over, get some ideas about the color of the pelage, the shape of the face. Those whiskers are gonna be very helpful. And the size, uh, we can't really see the front flipper or the rear flippers in the photo on the left, but the photo on the right, you can see it's a very large, very wide front flipper. All right, you can go to the next slide. So this face is a little bit different in that it's more of a bear-like face. The nose is a little... Uh, the, the snout is a little more abbreviated, giving it a, like a little upturned appearance. Um, the nose pad, which is what we call, you know, on your dogs, it's that cute little fleshy part of their nose. These guys, the otoriads have the same thing. Bosids do not. That's another helpful one. Bosids have furry noses. Um, but uh, these, this guy has a larger nose pad, so it comes up and around the top a little bit um, more than than um, the other three species. Immediately, with something like this size, there are some that there's some species we can rule out immediately. We don't have a lot of really large fur seals up here for the most part, so let's take the fur seals out. Um, there are some speckling on there that could, you know, you could turn into harbor seal spots if you wanted to. Um, but it's far too large to be a harbor seal because it's got that scale bar in it. And we know that harbor seals don't get that big. They get to be about maybe four and a half feet tops, five. Um, let's see. So it's got an external ear. And if you look, you can see very lightly, there's a really long white vibrissa. I think hopefully it was covered in, in Mo's, Mo's presentation. The color of elephant seals whiskers are black and I don't see black whiskers there. Those are white. So we can remove the Northern elephant seal. That with that color and that size, it could certainly have been an elephant seal, except for those front flippers don't match. So we got rid of both seals and we got rid of both fur seals. That leaves us sea lions. So adult females can certainly be this color of California sea lions. 
but something this big and this light can't be a California sea lion because they the males just aren't this light when they're this large. They could be when they're younger, but um, they that beautiful honey colored pelage you can even see it in the in the right photo. That's a really large animal. These photos aren't from the same animal and you could see it's pretty consistently that really pretty honey color. If you go on um, iNaturalist and search stellar sea lions up in Alaska, there's big haul outs of them and you'll see everyone's the same color except for on the bottom. You could see a little bit of the red staining on on this guy. Um, but if you guessed that this was uh, a stellar sea lion, you are correct. It's got that really long, see that really long white whisker and that little upturned nose and a bear like face, external ear flaps, which would also rule out the elephant seal, front flippers that are void of nails and are long, like they go past the end of the ribs long. Um, seals have short, stubby nail uh, front flippers that are functional for them for what they do but they're not really long like that and they also both species of seal have nails full-on nails on their front flippers these guys uh sea lions and fur seals don't have any nails they have very um abbreviated nail buds they aren't functional they don't grow nails anymore um, so they, they, uh, have the remnants of buds on their, on their front flippers, but you can't really see them unless you know what you're looking for. But this is a stellar sea lion. This is a sub-adult, it's either a sub-adult male or an adult female. Adult females are the size of an adult male California sea lion. They're very big. Stellar sea lions, the males get to be about 2000 pounds. The females get to be about 1800 so, oh no, yeah, no, that's elephant seals. Um, they get to be about um, 700 pounds, the females. Anyway, so this was a stellar sea lion. Next slide. All righty, I'll give you guys a moment. We have also, again, the benefit of the scale bar. We have short flippers in the front. And even though you can't really see it on the front flipper because it's covered with sand, you can see a little bit of it. There's some nails poking out um, on, you can see on both sides. The skull is incomplete, but it would be awesome to photograph it because there are some features of the um, cranium that are still very helpful for telling us what species and sometimes what age it is. But you have this pretty chocolate back, kind of a torpedo body shape. And very distinctive from everything that we've looked at so far, very distinctive rear flippers. And that's if you have your resources available or you remember something from your first um, master class here, uh, they're very telling. And there's also something else that's very telling, a couple things that's very telling in this photo. That pink tie on the left rear flipper is from beach watch. That's how they mark their, um, their carcasses that they've gathered data on. They share that data with us and we report it to NOAA, but they mark them with, uh, it's cotton fabric. They do surveys on most beaches every two weeks. So they do that so that um, uh, they're not double counting information. Uh, we also mark carcasses uh, with either green twine or, or white cotton string um, so that we're not also um, documenting things over and over. Um, but we can go to the next slide and walk through this ID. So again, the circles are what you want to be taking photos of, and they're things that you want to note. If you were standing over this animal, you would see this hair is very short. It grows in one direction. Um, the skull is falling apart. For folks like me who process skulls, it's an indicator of, of youth. Um, uh, the older they get, the more things stay together. Uh, but we have these 
um, also these short front flippers that don't really extend past the ribs. They're very short. You couldn't imagine them walking on land with them like uh, sea lions do. So knowing that this critter has nails on its front flipper, we can remove all of the odoriates, all of the aired seals, because we just don't have, they don't have those features. Uh, they have longer nailless front flippers. So now we're left with the two species of seal. Um, one has a pretty distinctive pelage features, you know, just solid colors of sandy brown um, outside of infancy. Um, harbor seals have a lot of variability in there. They can have no spots. They can have a lot of spots. They can be gray with white spots. They can be tan with black spots. They can be, you know, silver with um, lighter spots or darker spots, but they, it's very variable. But Sometimes they don't even have that many spots, but I don't see any spots on this animal. There is a big wound right in the back, but there are no spots here. But if we're, if you really want to tell the difference between the two species of seal, you'd have to go to the rear flippers um, to really kind of slam dunk this one. Um, because one of the species not only has a deep V, in the rear flippers, which is illustrated here, but they have uh, no nails. The other one does. So it, it makes it very easy to distinguish between the two species of seal. Uh, this one, I don't see any nails. I see very large outer toes, which are very distinctive for this species as well. And that deep V is very telling uh, for a Northern elephant seal. So if you guessed Northern elephant seal, um, you are correct. And a couple of other things to note in this photo, um, on the right rear flipper, hopefully Mo will arrow it. Um, there's a, there's, um, a plastic roto tag with a number on it. If you ever encounter anything like this, we would love you to photograph that as well. Or if you're just reporting it to our hotline, please note the number don't remove the tag, please. Um, uh, and we can actually um, find out who placed that tag and report back to them. Some of the uh, researchers who place tags uh, on these offshore islands or in doing uh, different types of research, um, they are tagging these animals and branding some of them to um, follow them for their life. So when we find one that's dead, we report it back to the researchers to let them know that their study subject um, has died. And we give them all of the um, morphometric data that we take. And we also give them the location and the date and they can close out their file on that animal. Um, it also gives us an idea of what happened with it. You know, the, was it a rehab animal? Did it go to uh, the Marine Mammal Center or another rehabilitation center in California and they get tagged before they are released? We report it back to them and let them know that their released patient died. Um, in this particular species, northern elephant seals, um, they have a very high mortality rate in the first year of life. As I mentioned earlier, their mothers, um, they spend about 30 days with them. That's a very short period of maternal attendance. They don't teach them anything. So these guys are out there trying to figure it out on their own. Uh, and a lot of them don't make it. It's about, I think about a 50% mortality rate for these guys in the first year of their life. Um, you can see in the middle of the back, there's a big round hole. That's a cookie cutter shark wound. Um, I don't know if, if, uh, that was pre or post-mortem, but we note them. We note that anyway. Um, and then looking at the, the skull, um, it's pretty non-distinct. Northern elephant seals don't have a lot of uh, the, the uh, features like post-orbital processes and things like that, that you guys may have discussed. And you certainly would see them in the skulls cheat sheet if you have um, access to that. 
Um, but this is um, a northern elephant seal um, pup. I believe it was one that was rehabilitated at the Marine Mammal Center. And it was found by Beach Watch down on Pomponio Beach. So he tried, but he didn't, he didn't make it, which is the story for a lot of these guys. Next slide. All right, we're going to throw a little curveball at you. First of all, this is an excellent, an excellent example of how to post to iNaturalist. When I go on, I mean, you can look at that photo on the left and it's an ambiguous blob. But if you get close up shots of the front flippers, the rear flippers, the teeth, the shape of the head, even when it's in poor condition like this, um, I know you guys didn't cover this in Mo's masterclass, so I'm going to walk you through a little bit of what we see here. I'll give you a minute, actually, to just kind of have a look at it. Tell me what you think. I'll, I'll note that these teeth are stained pink. That's a helpful hint. Um, most pinnipeds have a very short tail. So that's something to note. Um, the picture in the four square on the top left, um, that's a little paw. That's a that's not a front flipper. It's an actual paw. Um, so go to the next slide and we'll walk through it. All right. So um, that front paw would take all the pinnipeds out. The fur, if it were in better condition, the fur would be very lush um, on this animal. It does have the densest fur of any mammal on the planet. And we're lucky to see them here, mostly in Monterey Bay. They're... they're um, Numbers are, are, well, they're starting to expand a little bit. I know that there's a handful of them uh, down uh, south of Año Nuevo, which is crazy bad neighborhood to hang around if you're a sea otter, because there's a lot of sharks there. Um, and I just gave the answer away. So if you had sea otter, um, you guys are so smart. I'm so impressed. Um, so sea otters, if you've seen them in the wild, they have these cute little paws that they use and the, and the pads are very rough. They use their hands for a lot of things, um, but they also uh, have these rear flippers that um, they use to propel themselves through the water. So people get confused a lot um, because they don't look like the regular stuff that we normally see. Uh, the tail is a bit of a dead giveaway because none of the pinnipeds have a tail that long. It's very short. Um, the teeth, if you guys guessed, uh, you know, by the pinkness and just those flat, those flat molars, those, those post canines or cheek teeth, they have many names, but the, they're flat and that's for grinding things. That's for breaking through shells, depending on what they eat. Um, the headshot isn't super great, but it can be helpful if we were trying to to um, look at everything just by photos. They could be very helpful, the bottom left photo. Um, and then in the full body photo, it, we would encourage folks, if you're out on the beach and you come across something like this and you want to take photos, if you have something like your foot that you can put in for... Um, for scale, it's really helpful. Not surprisingly, things like this often wash out. And the folks like us and Department of Fish and Wildlife who document sea otters, uh, we sometimes have to go by photos. So uh, having something for scale uh, in the photo would help us determine uh, even a general age class. Because uh, if you look at the, the left-hand photo, you can't really get a, an idea of size, but if your foot was in it, you would you would for sure have a better idea. It would narrow it down a little bit, but you guys are doing great. This is a Southern sea otter. Next slide. All right, I'll give you a second to have a look at this. I can't tell if that right flipper is 
the top or the bottom. But we have the benefit of a scale bar again. It's pretty dark. Okay, so that's the, the bottoms of both rear flippers. And you get the... This is one of my field photos, so I usually like to include the top and the, the dorsal and the ventral or top and bottom of, of the front flipper. So you have a nice, pretty dark chocolate pellage. Mixed colored whiskers, probably lighter, darker with the lighter tips. There seems to be... Some they're long and tapered, all the flippers, and there seems to be some hair distribution down the front flippers on the dorsal side. So, if you want to go to the next slide, all right. So, in the top circle, you can see the ear flap. And in um, otoriads, you're, if they're not heavily scavenged, you're going to see that. But because this is a pretty small animal and it's really dark, these are like the, this is where we're going to get into the super similarities between all four otoriads at a certain time of year. Um, this guy is dark, but baby sea lions and baby stellar sea lions can be dark and this size. So we need to go looking for things that are going to tell us what, what species it is. I see long, narrow rear flippers and front flippers. Um, so I'm going to kind of start exploring the idea that this might be a fur seal because this is about the size we see them. Uh, one of the things that you can look for if, again, if you have gloves or you're, and you're permitted to, to actually touch the fur or even you don't have to touch it to figure it out, but you can look at it and see that it's very different, that it, it, it doesn't lay down in, in one direction. Um, it, it could have the two toned or the two types of, you know, the buffy undercoat and then the longer guard hairs, um, what else can I say about this? Uh, the hair down the back, the dorsal side of the front flipper uh, should be uh, distinguishing it from a northern fur seal. But again, like I said, if we were looking to rule out sea lions, baby sea lions have big clunky flippers, things that they haven't really grown into. So these don't look like, these look proportional. They don't look uh, proportionate. They don't look oversized like a baby and the face isn't muted like a baby even though you can't see the face the shape of the head doesn't look like the muted baby face um so we've ruled out northern fur seal let's go ahead and remove the sea lions it's not a seal based on the features of the front flipper so really all that leaves us is a guadalupe fur seal and that's what this is a guadalupe fur seal next photo Ooh, yucky. Give you guys a second to look at this. We didn't get a great shot of the rear flippers. Um, the front flippers are really short. The face looks a little dog-like. It's got whitish vibrissa. There's some spots on it. There's that's something to explore a little bit of. We have the benefit of the scale bar again. Um, it's pretty light. So if we were thinking, okay, front flippers, you can see nails there. Um, so that's going to take out all of the short stubby front flippers with nails. Out go all of the otoriads. We don't have to think about them again. So now we're here to determine which type of seal it is. Um, if we look, you can see the white whiskers. Um, and elephant seals don't have white whiskers. They have black whiskers. So even though we think it might be a harbor seal, we need to go and find more stuff on this carcass to let us know that it's a, a confirm that it's a harbor seal. 
it has spots. Check. Um, if you were to look at the, if there was a better photo of the rear flippers or a closer photo of the rear flippers, they also have a, a V. It's not as dramatic as a northern elephant seal, but, uh, you know, an elephant seal is, is like, let's see, it's like, like this and harbor seals is more like this. So there would still be a V if it were tagged by somebody, it would be in the rear flippers. Odoriads are tagged in the front flipper, um, but it's got these short fl uh, front flippers. If you looked at the underside of those front flippers, they would also be furry. Um, har harbor seals or bull seals have fur on both sides of their front and rear flippers. But um, given the spots, the light coloring, the short stubby nailed front flippers, the white whiskers, and let's pretend we can see the shallow V of the rear flippers. This is a Pacific Harbor Seal. And these are probably one of the most common of the six because pretty much any beach you visit that has reef has these guys on it. You come down here by where I live at, at you know, near Fitzgerald Marine Reserve or you travel south to anywhere between here and Southern California. There's lots and lots and lots of harbor seals, uh, even going up north all along the coast from um, Alaska down. But this is a Pacific harbor seal. We see them in all age classes and sizes, all different colors, uh, everything like that. So next slide. All right, so somebody had mentioned and we can, um, We'll talk about it as we work through this one, Mo, because uh, this is very um, pertinent to that. This is a pretty decent sized animal. There's a scale bar again. This is on iNaturalist. It was from my iNaturalist. Um, and you can see what I did with the, with the rear flipper up top. I put my foot in it because it was big. Um, and I wanted to note that even though I had my scale bar there, I don't know why I used my foot, but um, we've got the benefit of a close-up shot of the rear flippers and of the front flipper. And you can see a color on this one. So we'll give you a sec to, to kind of digest that. And then we'll go on to the next slide to walk through this ID. All right. So you'll see in the left-hand photo, there's external ear flaps. Um, in two of the four species that we have to consider, because these are really long front flippers with no nails, um, two of them have longer external ear flaps than the other two. So we're going to jump into this. Um, they look a little longer, but let's just stay with the otorides and, and see if we can't walk through this. I'm sure that that lower um, front flipper on the lower right corner, I see a very distinct break in the fur distribution that is the dorsal side or the top side of the front flipper so that is a distinctive um id uh, part because that's that's very distinctive to one particular species and i'm sure the you guys know by now but we'll continue walking through because you can look at this animal and think all right well with with that break in the fur on the top it might be a northern fur seal but let's go find things that would tell me it's a northern fur seal you can see in the photo in the top right that that rear flipper is really long and it's pretty um uh it's not very wide so they're long and wide i don't know if you could see in this photo on the top the the placement of the rear flipper nails uh, on the three nail on the three toes in the middle. Um, they're really far back from the tip of the flipper. Um, and then if you were to look, the mouth is open a little bit. If you were to look in the mouth, the, the teeth can be 
kind of diminutive in this species. Um, the fur would be, I mean, it looks kind of fluffy. Um, and it's a darker brown. So any thoughts? Anybody? There were two California sea lion guesses. The That distinctive break um, in the fur around the wrist or, you know, and the lack of fur on the dorsal side of the front flipper um, in an animal that is not completely decomposed because then that's a whole game changer. This one's in pretty decent shape. Uh, so I can believe that the, the nakedness of the front flipper, um, is how it was in life. And that would make this a Northern fur seal. The thing that, uh, was unusual about this is you can see it's much larger. This is one of maybe five subadult males that I have responded to in my life. Um, never alive, uh, in my life, but um, these guys, uh, it's very rare to see anything but pups or under one year old uh, of this, this species. Um, during big storm swells and stuff like that, things get washed off of the Farallons and they end up coming out here. Um, and something to note about Odoriads is that when you see their front flipper, um, the, the ventral or the, um, the underside of their front flipper, they all have a t-shirt line. That is not where you're going to make that distinction. It's always going to be on the dorsal side. So Northern fur seals would have a t-shirt line all the way around. Everybody else just has it on the underside. Just remember Northern fur seals have the t-shirt line. They're the only ones that have it on the dorsal side but every all the other odorides have it on the underside so that's not really helpful when it's on the ventral side so if you had northern fur seal this was a subadult male next all righty so we don't get a huge variety of of um smaller cetaceans um but we want to uh, cover them because there is a chance that you may encounter them and we want you to be able to at least tell what it is. The most important thing would be to call somebody in the stranding network. If it's fresh, you want to call the Marine Mammal Center. If it's more like this, then call um, us right away. Call uh, Cal Academy, um, our hotline right away. Um, a lot of these things get washed out, especially when they're in the inner title like this. So looking at the profile, you can see a melon, like the forehead that comes down onto a rostrum. So that's something to note. We don't get the benefit of a um, dorsal fin in this one, but um, there are teeth. So um, these teeth are more conical than they are spatulate. So we can remove porpoises. Uh, it also doesn't have the rostrum profile of a porpoise. A porpoise has a sloping forehead that goes straight down to the nose. Um, there is one dolphin that has that same profile, but that's not what we're looking at right here. This is probably the most um, common regular sized dolphin that we get around here because there's a nice... Um, representation of this species here on the coast. Um, they like to hang out right off of Ocean Beach. You'll often see them kind of bouncing around Muscle Rock, uh, just um, running around with their friends and jumping in and out, of, uh, jumping out of the water. They're very showy. Um, so the conical teeth tells us it's a dolphin, just based on how often we see them versus other species. And the features um, are very indicative of it. This is a bottlenose dolphin. Flipper, if you will. That's why people know them so well, because when you go to marine parks, most often this is the species that you see. Um, or if you're my age, you know the show Flipper, and that's why we're familiar with it. But um, these guys, um, they can be, we've had calves all the way up to full adults, which can be 11 feet long. 
and like three or four or 500 pounds. You don't really know how big they are until you're standing next to one. Um, but this is a bottlenose dolphin. You guys are getting it. This is awesome. I really, I really like this. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, but teaching this process is super important and helpful if you want to teach other folks how to do it. So next slide, please. Now we're really going to get you. So this is uh, my observation on iNaturalist. I was not very good at documenting. Um, I responded to this animal. I was not great at documenting. Uh, or I could put more photos. I'll put more photos up of the rear flippers and stuff. I didn't get the, the dorsal fin very well. In the picture that's on the far left, you can see a little bit of it. But folks who really like these this species uh the dorsal the dorsal fin placement is very helpful in identifying especially folks who do be uh you know like boat naturalist work and and you're having to id live animals on the water um but any any guesses anybody have ideas i would love to hear what folks think of this i will say that it was initially reported as a shark and came to us as um, from a shark biologist that we sometimes work with, uh, and it was not. Three people know what it is? Wow. So let's see it in the comments. I want to hear it. Oh, that was the last one. I was going to say I'd be really impressed. Um, so this is one that we don't see very often, but um, it, it looks like a sperm whale and it's not exactly a, like the same species as a sperm whale, but it's got this completely underslung, uh, jawline, very small, like a sperm whale, uh, a dorsal fin that's about two thirds of the way back on the body. It's pretty small. I, I don't have a scale bar in there. This was a pretty weird this just happened last week um you can okay we'll talk about that then um but it's it's an interesting looking creature and it looks like a sperm whale so you can kind of jump off into things that look like sperm whales you can put it on iNaturalist and see what they they think you can send us photos and we'll kind of run through that. We also want this stuff reported straight away to the Marine Mammal Center or to us. Um, but it might surprise you to know that there are two species of smaller sperm whale that aren't, they aren't from the same uh, genus as, as uh, large, the regular large sperm whales. Um, you can see the little teeth on the bottom um, this is actually uh, a pygmy sperm whale. And of the little sperm whales that we see here, this is the most common one. I'm not even sure we've had a Kojiasema here, the dwarf sperm whale. This is um, a Kogia breviceps. So it's a, it's a, a pygmy sperm whale. We were able to go out with the Marine Mammal Center and do a field necropsy. She was too big um, to transport to the Marine Mammal Center. Um, and they are awaiting um, their histological examination uh, samples uh, to figure out why she died. She did have... Um, she did have a little like four centimeter fetus inside of one of her uterine horns. So that would confirm to us that she was an adult. She was three meters long. So they're not very big. The other species, uh, the, 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 the dwarf sperm whale is even smaller. They're less than three meters, but this was a, a beautiful uh, pygmy sperm whale that we worked on last week. Next slide. All right. So hopefully you've taken away this process where, you know, we know that there's X amount of pinnipeds. There's X amount of, you know, 
common cetaceans that show up here. Um, but we don't want you to take one characteristic and run with it. So when a characteristic leads you to believe an animal is a certain species, kind of like what we did with the fur seals, find as many other indicators as you can of that species to confirm or deny your ID. Take a lot of photos. If you think, oh, I think this is an elephant seal, but when, you know, then it's got spots on the side, but it's got short front flippers but it's got white vibrissa, you know, take photos of all of these. Pretend you're going to sit at a table with people and spread photos out and convince them of what you saw. That's how you photograph um, these guys. Um, if you look at that photo, you see these long, long rear flippers and long front flippers. Um, but if you're standing closer to it, the fur doesn't look like a fur seal, like they have those flippers this actually was a, a little baby uh, was a like a one-year-old sea lion in in, a, in one of the bad years that they were starving and the and those front flippers and the rear flipper flippers just look really exaggerated because this animal was very thin and had died as a result of starvation which was something that was going on in 2015 but this is a california sea lion but if somebody jumped off on just the features of the rear flippers they might call it a fur seal of some sort and it's not so always document it as much as you can even if you think you know what it is find the other features that make that animal uh what you think it is because that's uh uh, that's how we do science. We don't guess. We we want to know for sure. So if it's a really um, in poor condition, sometimes we have to just kind of leave it as an unknown. We don't guess. If we can't find stuff uh, to confirm anything, then, then we just leave it as unknown. Um, there are ways if you're a super sleuther and hopefully we'll be able to do a super sleuthing module for you guys at some point um even on a tangled mummified mess there are still ways to identify things um to species i had one that was uh, it was mummified it was tangled and scavenged and there was like one uh, uh one front flipper there was a baculum which is the penis bone uh, that was mummified and sticking out. There was a little bit of fur on the back of one of the front flippers and a little tuft of fur coming off of one of the other parts. The head was gone, but because it was small, the rear flippers were uh, long. That baculum was there, so I knew it was a male. That tuft of fur was a fur seal fur, and the fact that there was fur, a little tiny patch of fur below the wrist on the front flipper, I was actually able to identify that to um, a Guadalupe fur seal based on almost nothing. But if you know where to look and you just know that there's some you know, fur in some spots and no fur in others, um, you could do it. You can super sleuth and we can get you... Uh, up there with the pros and helping us out a lot with uh, identifying some of these. Next slide. We can use DNA to confirm species, but it's pretty cost prohibitive. Elisa Whalen asked if we can use DNA to confirm species. We do that with um, cetaceans a lot. We, we had that happen with a beaked whale that was in really poor condition up in Bodega uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and we sent, um, we were only able to collect a portion of a broken jaw that had two really distinctive teeth in it. So we were thinking it was a really cool, like a ginkgo toothed beaked whale. We sent the specimens off to be tested for DNA and it came back as a hubs beak whale and everybody was disappointed. They wanted some crazy weird ginkgo tooth beak whale, but we, we can, we don't really do it unless we suspect uh, with pinnipeds, unless we suspect that it might be a hybrid. The Marine Mammal Center encounters that more than we do, um, but it's pretty cost prohibitive and not really necessary. It's really easy to figure out what they are based on their, on their uh, physical features. Um, so uh, because we're part of the Stranding Network and we're tasked with um, examining all of these critters uh, we want to hear about it so if you're anywhere on the entire west coast and that includes alaska um, 
we want you to share this number and call our West Coast Marine Mammal Stranding Hotline. It's kind of a clearinghouse for reports and they will report it to the folks in the area that the animal is stranded in. Um, and for entangled whales, if you're out on the water or if you can see one from the shore, certainly call our the Entangled Whale Hotline or raise the US Coast Guard on VHF channel 16 if you're on the water. They will most likely ask you to either give them coordinates or or um, stay with the animal until a disentanglement team can get out there. Marine Mammal Center has a disentanglement team. There's a number of disentanglement teams all along the West Coast, including Alaska. Uh, so if you can give them as much information as far as where you've seen it, then the better uh, outcome for that animal. Um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is where we are, um, um, there are live uh, for live distressed marine mammals. You can call the Marine Mammal Center. Uh, for dead marine mammals, call the California Academy of Sciences, or you can uh, email us at marine mammals at calacademy.org. For live whale sightings, the cetacean field research team at the Marine Mammal Center uh, would love to hear from you. So if you're in San Francisco Bay taking photos of whales or you're outside somewhere, you can go ahead and and um, report that to them. They have a catalog of different species. And also please uh, get really good at doing iNaturalist and, and uh, posting your photos there. As I said, you can tag me there, Sue Pemberton, all one word. And I um, go on there every morning. Next slide. All right, and if you want some more of what we did today, you can learn a little bit more about marine mammals at the Advanced Marine Mammal Identification Course. These are a series of modules that we created for our work with Beach Watch, but we felt they were just too great to keep to ourselves. So they are now available to you if you go to, um, I think they'll post a link for you to go to uh, our just our calacademy.org website. And just if if you don't have the link, just search Advanced Marine Mammal Identification Course and it'll take you right to it. And if you have any questions about that, certainly don't hesitate to email us. Um, these are additional resources. You can go to noaa.gov and they have individual pages for all the species in the Pacific here. Um, for um, Marine Mammal Anatomy and Pathology Library at UCSC, they have a very comprehensive um, page with tests and stuff like that that you can really learn more about pinnipeds and marine mammals. And then um, you can get the Marine Mammals of California Waterproof Ocean Users Guide. If you print it out you're gonna have to waterproof it yourself otherwise it's just um if you were able to purchase it probably down in monterey it would be waterproof next slide and funding for this training was provided by a 2020 noaa john h prescott marine mammal rescue assistance program grant awarded to the california academy of sciences um hopefully you guys enjoyed this um, and I'm hoping that you feel a little more um, capable when you're out on the beach looking at dead things. Amazing. Thank you so much, um, Sue, for spending this time with us. Thank you, viewers, for being here. Um, I am going to, the chat will close when the event is no longer live, but we will add every single resource that Sue mentioned today into the permanent comments section of it so you can go back anytime. And I also wanted to throw in just in case anybody missed the or any of the or either of the two earlier sessions that were mentioned, this is a link to the playlist with all three, so you can watch them again at any time. Um, and if you missed any of your worksheet questions, you can go back and pretend you didn't do it all over again. <laughs> so um, yeah, um, so thank you again so much, um, Sue, and to everybody who watched this stream or any of the others. We look forward to offering um, more. And if you happen to have a question for Sue that you didn't get to ask today, you can leave that in the permanent comments as well. We'll work with her to get an answer back to you. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, to every there's lots of people saying thanks in the chat, um, Sue, but this awesome. was wonderful. Yeah, we appreciate it. And we'll be back with some sort of more amazing content soon. Um, we hope. Thank you for being here. Awesome. See you soon. Bye-bye.